All right, my dear geometry students, this is lesson 6-4 in your geometry concepts and applications text. It's titled Isosceles Triangles, and it is on page 246. It's a, just a plain Braille page, 246 straight up, 6-4 Isosceles Triangles. In print, it's on page 246. And it'll start out with the what'll you'll learn. And you're going to learn to identify and use properties of isosceles triangles. And then it launches into recalling what you learned in a previous chapter, in a previous lesson about isosceles triangles. That term should sound very familiar. And we had to learn to identify different triangles like scalenes, <coughs> equilaterals, isosceles. This is all about isosceles and a couple of cool things that go on with isosceles in regards to their angles and their medians and altitudes. So it says, recall from lesson 5-1 that an isosceles triangle has at least two congruent sides. The congruent sides are called legs. The side opposite the vertex is called the base. And the vertex is made up of the two legs. So when the two legs come together, that's the vertex. In an isosceles triangle, there are two base angles. The vertices where the base angles intersects the congruent sides. And the base angles are the angles opposite your legs. All right. And there's a graphic on the next Braille page and a graphic right below that paragraph of information in print. There is a bit of a typo and a brailo in this graphic, both in print and in Braille. Um, first, we'll, we'll do the outline of the triangle, and then we'll talk about the different parts and then the typo, the brailo. So on the left, there's a left side of our triangle from the top vertex down to the bottom left. But they're labeling uh, vertex at the top and base angle at the bottom left. And then from the top vertex down to the bottom right vertex, again, another base angle. Then straight across from base angle to base angle is the base of your triangle. On the left side from the ver vertex to the base angle, there's a tick mark running through that side. And on the right side from the vertex to the base angle is a tick mark running through that side. And they're identifying that those are the legs and those are congruent in an isosceles triangle. Then down at the base angle, there's a tick arc through that vertex. And at the other base angle on the right, there's a tick arc. That's showing congruency of those two angles. Where there's a brelo and a typo, also in print, is they put a tick arc at the vertex. That's incorrect. The vertex is not always congruent with the other two angles. They should not have put a tick arc up there. There should only be tick arcs at the base angles to show that those are congruent and they are opposite the legs that are congruent. So if you go from the vertex on the right, and go at an angle immediately opposite that vertex. You hit the opposite side, that leg. And if you go to the vertex on the left and you go through the triangle immediately opposite that vertex to the side on the opposite side, that's the other leg. So that's what they're saying by angles opposite the legs are also congruent. We talked about this in chapter five also. Now we're going to turn several Braille pages. So we get to theorem 6-2, which is on Braille page 247A. In print, we're on page 247, looking at our blue highlighted box for theorems. And the first theorem for isosceles triangles is theorem 6-2. So this is on 247A, theorem 6-2. And it says in words, if two sides of a triangle are congruent, then the angles opposite those sides are congruent. And it gives a, it gives a model with a top vertex of A, a bottom left vertex of B, and a bottom right vertex of C. That makes the outline of your triangle. On side AB, they have one tick mark. And on side AC, they have one tick mark. So that shows congruency of those two sides. So you know it's an isosceles triangle, and those two sides would be called the legs. And then at vertex B, there is one tick arc. And at vertex C, there is one tick arc. And that shows that the angles opposite the legs 
are also congruent. So theorem 6-2 says if two sides of a triangle are congruent, then the angles opposite those sides are also congruent. So B equals C. All right, turn the page to theorem 6-3. Print users were right below the 6-2 theorem at 6-3. We're on page 247B in Braille. And theorem 6-3 states in words, the median from the vertex angle of an isosceles triangle lies on the perpendicular bisector of the base and the angle bisector of the vertex angle. So this is super important in an isosceles triangle and really rather cool. So let's take a look at our model and decipher what they're saying here. So we have vertex A at the top, go down to the bottom left to vertex B, and the bottom right to vertex C, and then join B and C together for your base. Side AB has one tick mark through it, and side AC has one tick mark through it, so we know it's an isosceles triangle showing those two sides are congruent. Those are the legs. Therefore, A is our vertex angle. Coming from vertex A through the midst of our triangle, they're drawing a median to the midpoint D of the side opposite, and you learned about medians in a couple of sections ago that it comes from a vertex and hits the midpoint of the side opposite. There's a right angle indicator showing that that's perpendicular. There's two tick marks from B to D and two tick marks from D to C showing that D is the midpoint and has divided BC equally so that those two segments are congruent. Therefore, you know that A is a median because it's hitting the midpoint and dividing. Also, because it's, a, it's, it's an angle bisector, you go back up to vertex A and you notice there's two tick arcs to the left of the median and two tick arcs to the right of the median. So if you notice that or if you're given that that's the angle bisector, then you know that also it's perpendicular to the side opposite and it's at 90 degrees. So this is three things. It's a median. Well, actually, it's four things. It's a median. It's an altitude because it's coming from a vertex perpendicular to the side opposite. It is a perpendicular bisector because it's bisecting the opposite side at a 90 degree angle and in half. And it's an angle bisector because it's bisecting angle A immediately in half. So an angle bisector ends up being several things in an isosceles triangle. Um, so that's really cool and that's something to remember that if you know and you're given that that's an angle bisector or it's a median or it's a perpendicular bisector in altitude, it's also the other three in an isosceles triangle. So then you should notice that it's creating as it splits this triangle in two, it's creating two equal halves and two right triangles. Um, so you can figure out the angles of your isosceles triangle knowing a bunch of this information. And that's what we're going to do in the next example. So in example one on page 247C, and, and just about the last half of the print page on 247, it says, find the value of each variable in an isosceles triangle DEF if EG is an angle bisector. So you turn your brain on, you're thinking about isosceles triangles because it's giving you that it's an isosceles. It's also giving you that a segment is an angle bisector. You turn your brain on about what you know about angle bisectors of, of isosceles triangles. They, not, they don't just split the vertex in half, but they're also perpendicular to the base. They're um, splitting the base in half. They're, they're perpendicular to it, so they're at 90 degrees. All that should kind of be intuitively rolling around in your mind. Now take a look at the drawing and kind of decipher it via the drawing. So we have vertex E kind of pitched up towards the top right, and then you follow that to, down to the left to vertex D, and then from E you could follow that down to the right to vertex F, and then you could join D to F for your base. 
and then it's saying from E to G. So you go back to your vertex E. It says EG is an angle bisector. So you know that this line going through the midst of your triangle is an angle bisector. So you know it's splitting E in half, even if it may not kind of look like it, you're being given that it does. So knowing that it's because of theorem 6-2, knowing that it's an angle bisector, you know that it's splitting E in half. It's of an isosceles triangle because you were given that, but also on your drawing, it shows that side ED has one tick mark and side EF has one tick mark. So we know a bunch of information about this triangle just based upon that EG. We know that EG connects with the side opposite DF at a 90 degree angle. So both sides of EG are 90 degrees. So we have 90 degrees in one of our little triangles and 90 degrees on the triangle on the right. On the triangle on the left, the DEG triangle, in the D vertex it's saying that that is X degrees. And then at the G point, the DGE, vertex, DGE angle, there's a little squiggly line, and it's stating that that is Y degrees. And then all the way over to the right, so our other triangle, EGF, it's indicating that at vertex X with the little squiggly line, that that is 49 degrees. So we can identify what X degrees and Y degrees are just based upon knowing that this is an isosceles triangle that we're given that EG is an angle bisector in the rules of angle bisectors of an isosceles triangle, and that they gave us one measurement of an angle at F at 49 degrees. We can figure out the rest of this. X degrees is going to be 49 degrees because the entire thing is an isosceles triangle. We know that those two base angles have to be congruent. They have to equal each other. So the D, the D vertex angle, is 49 degrees. The Y degree angle on the left side of our segment EG, we know is 90 degrees because we know from theorem 6-2 that if we have an angle bisector of an isosceles triangle, that bisector from the vertex hits the base at a perpendicular angle. It's a perpendicular bisector. So we know that that's 90 degrees. If they asked us what the other side of it is, we know that's 90 degrees also because 90 and 90 are 180 and that's a linear pair. Knowing that one angle is 49 and one angle is 90, we could figure out the other angle, couldn't we? By knowing that there's 180 degrees in a triangle. So we could go 49 plus 90 is 139. 180 minus 139 is going to be 41 degrees. We know those angles up at the top are each 41 degrees. And the entire angle up there at vertex E would be 41 and 41 or 82. And we could check it by saying 49 and 49 for the equal angles of our isosceles triangles. That's um, 98 and 98 plus 82, there's our 180. So just knowing one little measurement of an angle, we could figure out the measurements of all the other angles knowing that EG is the angle bisector of E. All right, so it's your turn on the next drawing. Turn to page 247D. Got a little bit interesting drawing to decipher here. It says, for each triangle, find the values of the variables. So we have two triangles that are sharing a base. There are two isosceles triangles sharing a base. If you start all the way over at the left at vertex M, these two triangles are coming together and forming a quadrilateral, but we've got to kind of look at them as two, two triangles, two separate triangles. So M and to the right at the top, go to vertex N. And then from vertex N, it splits off. It goes down from about 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock to vertex P. And then from P, it goes back up from about oh, 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock to vertex M. So there's one of your triangles, M, N, P. From M to N at the top, it has one tick mark through it. And from M to P, M at the left, P at the bottom right, it has a tick mark through it. So you should have noticed that this is an isosceles triangle. MNP is isosceles. MN and NP are the legs, and M is the vertex. At vertex P, they have a little squiggly line indicating that the measurement of that angle there is 65 degrees. 
So if you know that measurement is 65, what do you know about the measurement of vertex N where they're saying it's X degrees? By definition of isosceles triangle, you should know that that's 65 degrees. Now, if you start at N, and, it, and in, it's at about the 11 o'clock position and go to about the 5 o'clock position to the right, you get to vertex O and then go back to vertex P. You have a smaller triangle, NOP, sharing that base, NP. That's on the right. NO, the top right there, has two tick marks through it and OP has two tick marks through it. So now you have another isosceles triangle. NO, two tick marks, OP, two tick marks. You know O is your vertex angle. Therefore, you know your base angle is at that vertex N and your other base angle is at that vertex P. Now the Braille's a little funky at the vertex P and it's saying that that is Y degrees. And then back at N, there's a little light squiggly and they're pointing out to the right of the uh, triangle and saying that that's 50 degrees. Well, knowing your isosceles triangle rules, you know that the base angles have to equal each other. So if that angle is 50 degrees, what's the Y degree angle? 50 degrees. So that's pretty simple, but it's the drawing that you have to make your way through and noticing that they're isosceles triangles. Turn the page to 247E. Braille users were immediately looking to the right. This is your turn problem B. There's a triangle at the top of our page. At the very top vertex is R. The bottom left is S. And then over at the far right is T. So this triangle in, an, in a sideway orientation. From R to T is one tick mark. And from S to T is one tick mark. So your brain should click in. I've got an isosceles triangle. So my vertex is T. From T through the midst of the triangle, they drew a line, and there's two tick arcs on each side of that line at vertex T. So that's indicating that that line is an angle bisector. So your brain should kick in and go, ooh, angle bisectors of isosceles triangles. Those are really cool because I know then they're perpendicular to the side opposite. They're a perpendicular bisector of the side opposite. They're the median. They're, it's the midpoint of the side opposite. It's the altitude. All these things are going on because you're able to decipher that it's the perpendicular, or it's the bisector, the angle bisector of T because of those two tick arcs up at vertex T. So then we go at vertex R, it's saying that that is Y degrees to the bottom of our, our uh, median or our angle bisector, they're saying that's X degrees. And then at vertex S, they're saying that that is 70 degrees. So engaging your isosceles triangle theorems, if vertex S is 70 degrees, then what is vertex R? 70 degrees. So it's the Y degree angle is 70 degrees. If this is an angle bisector extending the median from, from vertex T through our triangle to the side opposite, we know that's a perpendicular line segment so the X degree angle is how many degrees? 90 degrees, because the definition of perpendicular means a right angle or a 90 degree angle. So there we just figured out all the angles. Knowing those, we could figure out even angle T, because we know that S is 70. X degree would be 90. 70 plus 90 is 160. We know there's 180 degrees in a triangle, 180 minus 160. We know that that little angle up there at the top is 20. So the other side of the angle has got to be 20. So the entire vertex at T is 20 plus 20, which is 40. So we just knowing that this is an isosceles triangle and that the S degree angle was 70, we were able to deduce the other measurements of the, of the angles. All right. So the next couple of pages, um, show, suppose that you draw two congruent acute angles on two pieces of patty paper. Patty paper is like the paper that you put between frozen hamburger patties at a restaurant. And, and then it says uh, if you rotate one of the angles so that one pair of the rays overlaps and the other pair intersects, it asks you what kind of triangle is formed. And so it shows the angles, angle Y on the first little piece of patty paper, 
It's a little square, and then it has an angle Y in the midst of it. And then it shows an angle Z on the second little piece of patty paper. And then it shows rotating the, 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 rotating the patty paper and overlapping each other, and it creates these two angles that overlap each other. And you're supposed to determine that if you have the same angle, you have the same base angles, so therefore you're going to get an isosceles triangle because those two angles are congruent and two base angles, then the side opposites are the two legs and they're congruent. And that's what they want you to deduce from this exercise, that you would get isosceles triangles, that angle Y and Z are congruent, so they are congruent on your triangle, therefore they're creating an isosceles triangle. So that brings us to theorem 6-4 which is just the converse of our original isosceles theorem, where it said if we have two congruent sides, we're going to have two congruent angles opposite those sides. Now we're going to say the converse, and this is what we learned back in chapter 1 and 2. So we're going to say if we have two congruent angles, we're going to have two congruent sides. And sure enough, in words, it says if two angles of a triangle are congruent, then the sides opposite those angles are congruent. And then it shows another drawing, vertex A at the top, vertex B at the bottom left, and vertex C at the bottom right. And then because B has a tick arc and C has a tick arc, then the side opposite those angles also will have tick marks. And we know if we're told those two angles are congruent, we have an isosceles triangle. We know that the side opposites are the legs and they too are congruent. So you would use that for future solving of problems in case you're just given the angles and not given the sides, you would know that it's an isosceles triangle. On the next example is an algebra link. Of course we're going to have an algebra link. And so we want to practice that because this would be more realistic to what's going to be on the end of course exam. So in the givens it says in triangle ABC, Angle A is congruent to angle B, and the measure of angle A is 48 degrees. Find the measure of angle C, AC, and BC. So this problem is going to take a little while. They work us through it, so we'll work through their proof. But first, let's take a look at the drawing. We have A at the top left, C at the top right, and B at the bottom right. So there's our triangle, ABC. They're telling us that A, they're giving us that A is 48 degrees. They're giving us that um, A is congruent to B. So they didn't even write in B as 48 degrees, but we could. We could just say, all right, B is going to be 48 degrees. So then we could even find C, couldn't we, if we had to? And it did say to find angle C. So we use our our 180 degree definition of interior angles, sum of interior angles for a triangle, if we have 48 at A and 48 at B, we've got what, 96 degrees? So 180 minus 96, what is that, 84? So we're going to have an 84 degree angle for angle C. So already, just by engaging our brain with the basics of triangles, we figured out part of the question. Then they show us from A to C has a tick mark. And from C to B as a tick mark. And it better because we know by the converse of the definition of a isosceles triangle, if we have two congruent angles, the sides opposite are going to be congruent. So those have tick marks and they're congruent. Above those tick marks on AC, it's saying that that is 4X. And, and to the right of the tick mark on CB, they're saying that's 6X minus 5. You engaged your brain with the tick marks and with the rules of isosceles. You know those two are congruent, therefore they're equal. Put your algebra brain on and go, oh, I need to make those equal to each other. So 4x equals 6x minus 5. All right, we're going to solve this. We're going to subtract 6x from both sides, get negative 2x equals negative 5. Divide negative 5 by negative 2, and we get a positive 2.5 for x. That's not what they wanted to know, though, right? They wanted to know the measurements of the sides, so we got to plug 2.5 in for one of the sides because we know the other one's going to be exactly the same. So let's plug it into the 4x because that's easy. 4 times 2.5 or $2.50, that's 10 or 10 bucks, right? So we know that each side is a 10. Done. 
that quickly, that simply just by engaging what you know about isosceles triangle and using some very simple algebra tools. Now, if you go to the next page, it walks you through the proof of it. All right, so let's walk through that because that would be something that maybe you might have to write out on the end of course exam. So it says the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B, and that's the first lunch bell for middle school. Um, measure of angle A plus measure of angle B plus measure of angle C has got to equal 180, and that's the angle sum theorem, isn't it? From long ago, the angle sum theorem. The interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. We use, we replace ma measure of angle A with 48 and the measure of angle B with 48 plus the measure of angle C to equal 180. We're able to do that because of the substitution problem property and you know what they didn't write in here but we should write because of the isosceles triangle theorem that their their angles would be congruent then we have um, or we're given that angle A is congruent to angle B in the givens then we, so we add them together we simplify and we have 96 plus measure of angle C equals 180 we subtract 96 from both sides using the subtraction property of equality and we get the measure of angle C is 84 now, since we can find AC, since angle A is angle B, and theorem 6-4 states that BC has to be congruent to AC, we know that BC equals AC because of the definition of congruent segments of our isosceles triangle. So then we use substitution, and we plug in 6x minus 5 equals 4x. We subtract 6x from both sides using the subtraction property of equality so we can combine like terms. Simplify and we get negative 5 equals negative 2x. Then we got to divide by negative 2 on both sides because of the division property of equality. And we end up with negative 5 divided by negative 2. A negative divided by a negative has to be a positive. Distance needs to be positive. So we get 2.5 equals x. And then we have to replace x for, with the 2.5. So we could go 4 times 2.5 is 10. And since they equal each other, uh, 10 would equal 10. But you could also replace the 2.5 into the 6x minus 5, and you would still get 10. 6x, 6 times 2.5 minus 5, you're going to get 10. All right, so there's the proof, proofs for that particular problem. If you turn a couple pages in, it's going to say um, on 249, straight up in Braille, turn print page, it's going to review that in Chapter 5, the terms equiangular, and equilateral were defined using theorem 6-4. And we can now establish that equilangular triangles are equilateral triangles. It's just a quick review, and we already did this earlier in the last chapter. We have A at the top vertex, B at the bottom left, and C at the bottom right. And then it shows at the left, A to B has one tick mark, A to C has one tick mark, and from B to C has one tick mark. And you know then that if you have a, the directly opposite, you're going to have a tick arc for your isosceles triangles because the, the rule is, is that the angles opposite are going to be congruent. And then therefore, um, it's equilateral, then, then they're also going to be, vertex A is going to be congruent. But if you just think about 180 degrees is the angle sum theorem divided by three, you're going to get 60 degrees all the way around, always, always, always. So therefore, a triangle is equilateral if and only if it's equilangular. And you would say the same thing. You would say the converse. A, a triangle is equilangular if and only if it's equilateral. We can say it front and back on that particular one. We use that biconditional statement, if and only if. So that's just a little quick review that we already deduced in the last chapter and now they're putting it in a final theorem of 6-5, of reminding us the biconditional statement that if a triangle has the same sides, they're going to have the same size angles, or vice versa. If they have the same size angles, they're going to have the same sides. And those angles are always going to be 60 degrees. There's no other way to divide up 180 by 3, correct? All right, and then that is the end of that lesson. You need to work on the check your understanding, and you should work on them from number two um, through uh, number 
uh, let's see, number 18 would definitely get you to practice all this stuff in regards to isosceles triangles. Where you'd really want to pay close attention is really reading these tactiles and identifying missing angles and missing sides. And then there's several problems that are algebra links that would be super important to do. Number five, number 15, and number 16 will really push you with the algebra link and with the proving as to why you can identify the value of x and identify the measure. That's the second bell for lunch. Identify the measure of um, the angles that are missing and the sides that are missing. All right, that's the end of lesson 6-4. Review that as many times as you need to and do the check your understanding problems to make sure you got this. We'll see you in the next lesson.